Uh, good morning. I'm uh, George McMahon with Arcadis here in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, the River Basin Planning Policy and Operations Standing Committee uh, uh, is conducting a series of interviews with prominent practitioners uh, on their experiences with modeling and model applications in water resources planning and management. On behalf of the committee, I have the pleasure today of interviewing Mr. Bill Warrick, uh, probably best known for his uh, pioneering work in the area of shared vision planning, uh, which I'm sure he will uh, describe in, in some detail later. Uh, Bill is primarily a water resources planner and, and a modeler, I guess, in support of that, uh, his planning work. He uh, began his career with the Corps of Engineers uh, quite a while ago, actually a year before me, uh, working with for 35 years with the Corps, uh, I think starting in the Buffalo District and moving on to the Institute of Water Resources, uh, which is a basically a core think tank outside of Washington, D.C. Uh, it's, it's really the planning support uh, agency for the Corps. <clears throat> um, He's worked with the State Department, USAID, uh, World Bank, and a number of other academic institutions uh, on, 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 on water resources planning and drought management. He was the first chairman of NOAA's Great Lakes Observing, Observer, Observing System, uh, serving from 2006 to 2013. In the early 1990s, and this is probably about the time I got to uh, yeah. became, became familiar with uh, Bill. Uh, Bill managed the core national study of water management during during drought. Uh, he met Rick Palmer there, and they developed uh, what what's commonly known now as shared vision planning, which combines systems planning and modeling with active stakeholder involvement. Uh, for the past 25 or so years, Bill has led large basin level planning efforts. Uh, in the mid 90s, uh, he helped apply shared vision planning to analyze uh, water allocation plans for the Apalachicola, Chattahoochee, Flint, and Alabama Coosa Tallapoosa basins in Georgia, Florida, and Alabama. And uh, I was also engaged in that effort. Uh, he was the lead U.S. planner on the International Joint Commission studies of Lake Ontario, Lake Superior, Rainy Lake, and Lake Champlain. Uh, uh, Bill, Bill helped implement adaptive management of Great Lakes water levels and has just been reappointed <clears throat> to the Great Lakes Adaptive Management Committee by the International Joint Commission. Uh, he's now working on an expedited review of regulation of water levels in Lake Ontario, including a design of new monitoring and modeling systems. Um, Bill, welcome to this interview. Have, uh, did I leave anything out important in your introduction? Nope. Nothing important. That's a good uh, thumbnail sketch of many, many years. Yeah, it's 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 uh, the longer you work, it's harder to uh, boil it down to a, uh, a couple of sound bites. But so uh, I'm going to go ahead and um, start the questions. Um, and so I'll, I'll start off with um, what do you do professionally and how would you characterize your main involvement with modeling water systems, water resource systems? Uh, as you said, I'm a water resources planner, uh, and I've been one for 42 years. I had a bachelor's in math, and I had done Fortran and basic programming uh, for a decade before I became a planner. <clears throat> so I had some background, but it was limited in modeling. In my early years as a planner with the Corps, I oversaw analysis done by economists and hydrologists and hydraulic engineers, and each one of those groups used their own computer models. So I got a working knowledge of them. Mm -hmm. After doing planning in Buffalo in 1988, I got a chance to work, as you said, at the Institute for Water Resources, IWR. Um, and just as I showed up, there was a terrible drought that affected much of the country in 88. Uh, and the head of the Corps asked, you know, couldn't we manage water during drought better? Uh, so Kyle Schilling, uh, was asked, who worked at IWR, was asked to put together a large multi-year study to answer that question. And even though um, I know he would have preferred somebody with more experience, I was available and he let me manage it, which was a lucky break for me. In the first year, we did design a better way 
to manage water during drought and to test it, we picked out four core districts to apply this method. Um, Seattle district was one of those cities. Each one of the case studies uh, got $500,000. And this bit of advice from me, don't waste any money on modeling. Now, th the reason I said this at that time was uh, I knew that models were black boxes to most people. And uh, they would only believe the results from models if they agreed with them. Um, that wasn't particularly helpful in a high conflict situation. But like I had been taught by the Corps, I listened. And in Seattle, a professor at the University of Washington told me things had changed. And he said, there's a way to build models that people will trust. And I have to say, when, when Rick Palmer tells this story, he stresses how wrong I was. When I tell it, I try to stress the fact that I changed my mind as soon as I heard it about his modeling process. That's interesting. But that, yeah, yeah, that that it was a, an overnight change of mind on my part based on his demonstration. Um, and that determined the answer to the question you asked for the next three decades. What do I do? I develop models designed to answer questions that are asked by experts, stakeholders, and decision makers who are involved in water conflicts. I think a big point that you made or two is that the models were understandable or, you know, were, were basically collaboratively developed uh, essentially to build trust in the model outcomes because the black box models, I, I know I've worked with many of those in my career. It's pretty hard to explain a heck five, for example. <laughs> no, exactly. Uh, and Rick had a long uh, career of experience with that. He had won an award from ASCE for a very simple to use model that he had built uh, to negotiate uh, water supply decisions around Washington, D.C. And it came after he built a very sophisticated optimization model. Um, so that was the beginning for him was 10 years before I met him. What have the big what are the biggest challenges in modeling water resource systems that you've encountered in your professional life? Uh, challenges or changes? Uh, excuse me, changes. Well, changes. both. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I, I'll address yeah. uh, both um, because there's a um, a tension between uh, obviously the uh, continual improvement in modeling and the need to harness those improvements to questions that people are asking. So let me let me do the old guy thing and say <clears throat> back when I started, uh, water systems weren't really modeled as systems. Um, like I mentioned, you know, th they were modeled in parts. So the hydrologist had a model, the economists have a, had a model. Uh, you know, for instance, in a flood study, a hydraulic engineer would use a model to produce stage discharge curves. And then the economist would type those results into a terminal connected to a computer in another city. And that model had stage damage information. And then you'd get the day discharge frequency tables from another model. And then the economists would put these together to present expected damages. And, and then we could do a benefit cost analysis with and without the project. Now, if I said, well, what about a levy a foot higher? The whole thing had to be started again. Uh, new contracts written for each section to change their models and run that alternative. And on the environmental side, um, there was not much modeling going on. Mostly uh, ecologists would respond in general terms. They would say, well, if you no longer flood the wetlands, you'll begin to see a deterioration in these plants, which will probably lead to a change in the birds and fish. Um, and then presenting the results that was not done on a computer, uh, there was a room full of tall drafting tables where men would trace flooded outlines using, they'd have a rack with a dozen protractors and French curves. And personally, I had no computer. All the desktops in my office were covered with blotters or calendars. <laughs> By the time I ran into Rick, uh, I actually had to get a Macintosh so I could run software, you know, remember, called Stella. <clears throat> And for the first time, we were now starting to be able to custom design a system model that looked at not only 
of, for instance, of water balance, but also the economic and environmental outcomes from that. Um, so Stella was really good for that stapling together part, taking um, modeling work that had been done by separate teams and creating a dynamic interchange. So it was pretty easy to change the operating rule for Lake Lanier and immediately see how it affected um, uh, it, uh, things down in Alabama. Um, at about that time, we started using the internet, the uh, mid or in early 1990s. But I'll just, uh, I don't know whether you remember this story, George, but uh, we weren't able to hook up the mobile district of the Corps of Engineers with email because the colonel there uh, wouldn't let professional staff have email addresses. The Army policy was that mail was answered by secretaries. So th this is just to say it was early days. Yeah. But now we could share <laughs> large data files and models, even though we worked in different cities. Uh, and on the um, on that study, we started to link Stella with Excel, which made the Stella models much more powerful and useful. Now moved to the IJC studies starting in 2002, and we started to shift away from Stella, which nobody had unless they joined one of our studies, to Excel, which everybody had, even the stakeholders, you know, people at home had Excel. And we started, this was just the beginning, to link in a crude way to GIS. GIS had the potential to be much more powerful and granular than the models I built, but on the negative side, they were the ultimate, at the time, black box. <clears throat> but that did start a shift in the way I did shared vision planning. When Rick and I started out, we actually worked with interested stakeholders and worked together to build Stella models. We did that, as you'll remember, on the ACT, ACF. We would sit down with guys like Steve Lightman in Florida, and he helped build the model. Uh, and that's how we built trust. Um, but we weren't going to be able to do that with GIS. So in the last 10 years, I've started to build trust in a different way, using shared vision models as the window into a black box. So I do less of the calculational load um, on Lake Ontario, the Stella model calculated hydropower production, uh, tributary water levels, uh, navigation costs. Um, now they're more likely to take complicated GIS results and present them in a way that answers people's questions. I'm more of a translator than a calculator. Yeah, the uh, the the um, evolution in computing power was even apparent in the during the ACT ACF because you remember the original Stella models were monthly models and they had a lot of um, shortcomings with respect to how they would answer things like hydropower generation and uh, you know on the part of the power customers so the model was converted to a daily model which yeah, uh, yeah. which took a lot longer to run but it did run you know and uh it probably gained some 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 more acceptance as a result. I think. Exactly, exactly. And we, you know, we 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 dealt because of our limitations with classic problems, like uh, <clears throat> for instance, how do you build a reservoir model that um, considers flooding and water supply? So in in Seattle, the big problem was refilling uh, the reservoir after it was lowered to create flood storage. Uh, if you didn't refill it soon enough and high enough, you hurt water supply in the summertime. So how do you build a model that looks at flooding, which happens on an hourly basis, and water supply, which is typically modeled on a monthly basis? Mm -hmm. In a way, our shortcomings made us deal constructively with problems like that. Uh, following up on that, um, uh, what changes do you expect in the next few years? And uh, and beyond that, how would you envision model, you know, the uses of models and their roles in decision making in the in the long term, say the next 10 to 20 years? Uh, I, I'm I'm expecting specific changes, and uh, and I think um, that we can prepare for them. Right now on the Great Lakes. I'm helping develop a new generation of models and planners. Uh, you know, uh, I'm 73 and still actively involved, but you know, what do I have? Another 30, 40 years and we'll have to find a replacement. 
Uh, yeah, you'd be a, what, 110 Probably, or yeah. <laughs> uh, but the same with the models. Uh, we built state-of-the-art models back, back in 2005, uh, but there's much more powerful tools available now, and they still have to be made uh, trustworthy. And for me, uh, there are some clear answers. I think uh, when we abstract water issues into models so that decision makers can play safely with alternatives so stakeholders can see how their lives will be affected, we're going to be uh, using highly granular GIS simulations. Uh, now, uh, the functions in these models have always been informed by research. You say uh, this species of plant requires this much water this time during the year, and that will still remain true. But more and more, they're going to be informed by satellite imagery and machine learning. This makes them so much more powerful uh, and much easier to uh, monitor and adaptively manage. The, man, the models still have to be built collaboratively, and now uh, it's important that they be built by multiple government uh, agencies or even governments. We find too often, for example, that uh, agencies compete with each other to build the most beautiful GIS outputs, when in fact what they should be doing is working together to create one GIS that's really good. Uh, there's a lot of repetitive tasks like developing digital elevation models <clears throat> that could be done um, at greater uh, in, uh, resource levels and then used by multiple agencies. Uh, and these models are going to be more integrated than ever before, uh, more faithfully representing the way policies and nature interact in real life. You change your hydropower operating rules and the environment changes. It happens in real life. We've got to have models that change the same way. So let me give you two quick examples to help clarify that mumbo jumbo. These are real, real examples uh, that show how I think models have to change and will change in the next couple of years. <clears throat> so this is from my Lake Champlain study. Uh, flood insurance now is like a last defense against floods. So you build in the wrong place, you drain wetlands, you replace forests with asphalt, you argue about whether to build levees, and then it floods. Well, at least you're insured. Uh, you haven't prevented the damage, but at least you've avoided financial ruin. But the fact is, is that most people don't buy flood insurance because they never really understood the risk, and so they thought that it wasn't worthwhile. Here's where a new generation of computer model that we've already built a pilot of could change everything. Uh, it's based on a GIS model uh, where expected damages are calculated for each house. So you can test the damages for any address with different climate change hydrology or different um, structural solutions or non-structural solutions. The model tells you what premiums have to be charged how much reinsurance companies would need to invest in. If you combine that with an opt-out policy, which means that each homeowner would have to sign a piece of paper foregoing flood insurance and taking the responsibility uh, for damages, you can inform that agreement by saying, um, we expect that you will have about $28,000 in flood damages in the next 10 years on, an, on the average. It could range from nothing to 400,000. Um, you can now, using this model that we've already built, you can estimate how much governments will pay out to subsidize insurance premiums for low-income homeowners. That's something that's done now. You can estimate these costs with a model like this, but also how much money the government's going to save in disaster relief because they have insurance. You can design parametric payouts where a computer sends you a check for 2400 when the water levels hit a certain level. So now the owner doesn't have to wait for a disaster declaration, an appraiser. Uh, you can replace the drywall before it gets moldy and so cut your overall damages by a third or two thirds. And government now can do more than benefit cost ratios for structural measures. They can actually look at their cash flow. So if you build a a levy or a, a control structure, um, you may save more on insurance subsidies than you needed to spend on construction. And all this because you have a truly integrated and granular model. This is a reality that we've already uh, done in, in pilot. The state of North Carolina has at least a very good start at the kind of 
um, data that's needed to do this. So I think in the next 10 years, th these will become commonplace. Second example, this will be quicker, erosion. So this was a big problem on the Great Lakes, particularly Lake Ontario. Really uh, sad tales of people who watched the lake nibble away at their property. Uh, and for the lower income people, it meant uh, literally dragging their cottages back towards the road to avoid falling into the lake. And for others, uh, you know, there was always the option of expensive shore protection. Um, but how do you design that? Uh, what size rock should they use? If they use big rocks, it was really expensive, but maybe little rocks wouldn't work. And how will that affect my neighbor? Because if the lake isn't eating my property, does it make his erosion problem worse? You know these problems, George, and in the past we've generalized uh, results from a, a limited amount of data that we get from a handful of cross sections. We use educated guesses about different uh, banks will absorb energy from waves. Uh, but nowadays, uh, you know, federal agencies get pretty good satellite images of every inch of coastline, uh, and they get new ones week after week. Um, the satellites, the businesses that take the photographs, the contracts for federal agencies to access these photographs, they're already in place. Just uh, pay attention when you read the news. I would bet that in the next two weeks, you'll read a story where a mystery is cleared up because a newspaper reporter has found satellite images that tell the truth. Uh, these images give so much data, there's almost too much to use. Imagine looking at uh, detailed pictures of the Lake Ontario shoreline, trying to work your way through all those miles of shoreline in high resolution photographs, and then starting all over again the next week and try to measure how much the top of bank has moved. So the other thing that has to be done is machine learning. Um, and here again, it sounds like science fiction, like a Tom Cruise movie, but in fact, it's being done more in Europe than in the United States. There's consultants already uh, doing this kind of work. Uh, governments need to train their coastal engineers how to do this. There are problems, but in the next 10 years, you'll see it happen more. And I'm actively pursuing this uh, kind of modeling on the Great Lakes. Now, last thing I'll say is <clears throat> machine learning is a deeper shade of black than any GIS we've ever experienced because there are no algorithms as such that we can pull out and explain. So that's going to be a challenge for shared vision models of the future. We'll have to be more than a window into the black box. We're going to also have to bring a searchlight. That's interesting. The story you talked about shoreline erosion was there's a there's a story I heard about of coastal erosion uh, on Jekyll Island back in the early 20th century. I think some of the te techno barons like Goodyear and I forget the other names had summer homes on the beach. And one of them uh, built, you know, uh, to prevent beach erosion and, and protect his property from eroding, built a, you know, a seawall. And the two neighbors on either side who were also wealthy businessmen didn't because they just they knew it was going to erode. So they just decided, well, you know, if it if it arose, we'll move our house back or we won't worry about it because they're rich enough. They didn't have to worry about it. But um, what happened, of course, is the properties on either side of the armored property you know, it eroded around behind and <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> destroyed the seawall that the one guy built. And he was kind of upset about it, but there wasn't much he could do about it. Kind of poetic justice, but yeah, but but that's the kind of uh, thing you face. It's still a an art. Yep, yep. We we don't know much about uh, you know the near shore and literal movements. Right. Uh. Next question is a is a pretty broad question, uh, and that's how do you how do you define success? That's a really important question for me. I think of my father's voice. Um, you know, the National Drought Study. I think uh, we got five million dollars to do that, and my father would say, "So what good did you do? I mean, if you tell me that you produced a lot of reports and interesting models, um, he would say." $5 million is real money. You should have made somebody's life better. Um, and so I've used that as a standard. Uh, success for me is when my work creates a real world
benefit. Less flooding, healthier wetlands, whatever it is. Um, uh, and, you know, uh, we'll probably talk about this more when we talk about um, case studies that have been successful and not. Um, what is the real value, uh, the, the most, or, you know, the, the essential value of modeling and water resources planning? Uh, you know, uh, I think it's essential. You, you can't do planning without modeling anymore. Um, I, I think I may have told you the story that Bill Whipple, um, uh, uh, an Army general who had also run uh, the New York World's Fair as the uh, chief of engineers there and <clears throat> who helped write the Marshall Plan told me that in the early 1950s, he had to convince the Corps to buy computers. They didn't see why they would need them. And he took the chief of hydrology and the chief of hydraulics uh, <clears throat> from Corps headquarters up to see his friend John von Neumann in Princeton, where Bill Whipple also uh, lived. And von Neumann said, well, what kind of work do you do? And they brought up the calculation of backwaters. Uh, and uh, von Neumann wrote the equations out on the board and was like flabbergasted. He says, guys, you need computers. Um, and uh, Bill's story was told to me anecdotally in a car driving someplace, but it's been documented in uh, core histories too. Uh, so that was the beginning. Uh, nowadays, uh, you just can't do anything except a very preliminary rough uh, view of an issue without models. They're absolutely essential. Yeah, I agree. I'm always amazed at what we could do back in the 60s and 70s uh, with very primitive computers, you know, by comparison to today and, and models as well. You know, you think about it, the, the first manned moon landing was probably done using computers with about the power of a programmable calculator, a handheld programmable calculator nowadays. It's, it's just amazing. It is amazing. And we are old enough to remember other tools, you know, the slide rule that's always brought up in conversations like this. But also, <clears throat> when I, I was still in college, still have mine. <laughs> me too, just yeah. uh, somewhere. I never use it. Well, I hang uh, mine on the wall just in case the power goes out. Oh, that's good. <laughs> Uh, but do you remember um, the machines that would do multiplication and long division? Uh, we would have them in our uh, labs at college, uh, and they were so complicated and used so much energy, uh, they had to be bolted to the lab desks because as the carriage <laughs> swung around, uh, you know, yeah. they, so, you know, we we got by without computers, but we never, hopefully never will have to do that again. Just a little aside, we had a we had mechanical calculators when I first started at the core, and yeah. they would do they would do multiplication and division, but on division, of course, uh, we we actually played a practical joke on one of the one of the folks we didn't like so much. We'd put a number in and divide by zero, oh. and it would just it would just grind and grind <laughs> until he came back and unplugged it. <laughs> Thinking about lessons learned, uh, what is the most successful real world? modeling project or modeling related project you've been involved with and what was your role and why do you think it was successful? Uh, without a doubt, uh, the most successful was the Lake Ontario study, <clears throat> the one uh, that looked at the release rules from Lake Ontario. So just to give you a little background, when they built the St. Lawrence Seaway, the flow of water from Lake Ontario into the St. Lawrence River now was controlled using a hydropower dam built by Canada and the United States power companies. <clears throat> there were rules, uh, international agreements about how much water could pass through the dam each week. And those rules were set in 1956 and were still basically in place when we started the study in 2001. Uh, needless to say, they did not consider environmental impacts back then. Um, and in that study, um, it involved a lot of people, you know, Pete Laux, and the most importantly, of course, Gene Stockey, Jerry Galloway. Uh, we, I auditioned uh, the shared vision model and they accepted it. And we used that to explore trade-offs between six different interests, uh, including coastal damage and navigation and uh, the 
stakeholder advocates for all these different positions all use the shared visual vision model to test their arguments. Um, change comes slowly. It wasn't until 2016 that the two governments were close to coming to a decision on a new uh, rule set. Um, we understood by that time that it would create environmental benefits that had not been possible before while allowing a you know reasonable trade-offs or an increase in benefits to other sectors. Uh, and uh, when I accompanied um, Lana Pollock, who was the US chair of the IJC at the time, uh, to a meeting at the Council of Environmental Quality across the street from the White House. So we're speaking to uh, assistant secretaries of commerce and defense, you know, the guys just below cabinet level. And we talked about the shared vision model. We all talked about outputs from the model. Um, the model was an implicit part of the acceptance of those new rules. Um, the changes have been institutionalized and maybe more importantly, um, with a model like that, it was possible um, to realize what people like Buzz Hollings had talked about. Um, we were now able to monitor the predicted outcomes from the model to see whether they were right and if they were wrong, how the decision should change. So this was the beginning of real adaptive management and and I would say probably was a bigger selling point to the governments at the time to have adaptive management um, the day of the new regulation plan. So that wins my prize as the most successful. It met that real world test that all the work we did led to a real genuine benefits to people. Just curious, uh, was there a single piece of software that the shared vision model, or uh, was that the platform for the shared vision model, or was it several different pieces of software? Now it was a system of models. Uh, during that study, we still use Stella uh, quite a bit. Uh, it did a lot of the calculations, but for instance, um, the environmental models, a lot of them required iterative solutions, and that was done um, I think that was done in C++. Uh, we had coastal models that were done in different languages. So we became uh, expert at integrating models. So there would be a process. Uh, a, a person, we had four competing teams trying to develop new plans. And each team could do a light evaluation with just uh, Stella and Excel, or they could do a full-fledged evaluation in which they used macros to call up uh, the integrated ecological response model and the uh, FERC model for coastal damages. So it, the modeling diagram is much bigger than Stella. It's interesting. Yeah. Um, conversely, uh, have you been involved in any particularly unsuccessful modeling efforts? And uh, if so, um, why do you think it was un they were unsuccessful? So I'll apply my definition of success, and this won't surprise you, uh, my biggest failure was the ACT-ACF that you were also uh, part of, not part of our team, but uh, certainly we worked together a lot on this. And and this despite the fact that the work we did was, I would say, for its time, just as good as the work we did on Lake Ontario. You know, uh, you remember Rick Palmer's uh, graduate students, brilliant guys and girls, uh, all kids, but they did great work. They did great documentation. We had built a lot of trust in the modeling system. We had a lot of insights because of it. Uh, but the big difference between ACT, ACF and Lake Ontario was, uh, it was like I just mentioned, I went to a meeting with Lana Pollock who had been appointed by the president. Uh, in the ACTAF, ACF study, we had that executive committee that represented the governors, but how often did I see the executive committee? Maybe once a year. And the governors, they only knew about my work through what the executive committee members heard in their one hour exposure to the whole study. Uh, Are you, you, you froze up there for a minute, so would you mind? Going back I'll start. Over you talked yeah. about the, the governor's um, only talk with the executive committee briefly. and So there was no real connection between um, 
the technical work in the decision making. And um, afterwards, after we, and you know, sign of success, uh, there was an interstate water compact signed by President Clinton, the first water interstate compact in the Southeast. But you, you know the rest of the story, George. Year after year went by, they couldn't agree on an allocation formula. Uh, and they let the compact lapse. Uh, all that effort um, in some eyes wasted. Um, and there are different postmortems. The blame is laid on different feet, depending on what your perspective is. Probably there's a lot of people that uh, deserve the blame. It, in my mind, um, a, a state like Georgia uh, sh will never and should not negotiate with other states if it believes it can win in a court of law. Um, and in my understanding, Georgia established its right to control those waters in court. So why should it negotiate with Florida and Alabama? Um, and uh, I may be wrong in my postmortem. I'd be interested in your views. Um, but uh, let me just say that because of ACT, ACF, Rick and I wrote a paper for an ASCE conference where we said, here's why shared vision planning doesn't work all the time. And we came up with what we called five triage questions. So we said, ask these questions before you do shared vision planning. And if you don't get good answers, don't do shared vision planning. Uh, and we went down to Brazil in 2014. We were invited down. Uh, they were in the middle of a terrible drought in Sao Paulo. And uh, we held a workshop, but we built a really nifty model, despite the fact that the data were uh, held in secret by the water agency. Um, and people got excited and we asked our triage questions and reviewed the answers. And in a workshop, we said, don't do shared vision planning. It'll be a waste of time and money. So that was uh, a failure and a learning experience. So so what do you what's your answer on the post? -mortem? Well, I, I think your point about. Um, you know, Georgia shouldn't negotiate. If they believe they can win in court, I think the. The problem there was all the original lawsuits were against the core. Yeah. And Georgia was only intervening on behalf of the core. Uh, it wasn't until Florida actually filed a you know case of original jurisdiction against Georgia that Georgia won in court finally. Okay. And even that, even that was a bit of a torturous process. But the the uh, what Georgia didn't want was the core to give in, I guess, or to make cons operating concession because the, the the lawsuits were all about how the core operated its reservoirs and the core exactly. the core didn't want the georgia did not want the core to basically give away or operate the reservoirs in such a way they compromised you know the, the water supply reliability predominantly of the metro atlanta region if you remember in 2008 i think it was we almost lanier was down to less than a 30-day supply of water yeah yeah and uh that you know was really uh, fortunately, we had a, a, you know, some big floods after that, but it was, uh, they were concerned that the Corps was releasing water to support uh, fisheries and stuff downstream, and basically all the water in the ACF system was coming out of Lake Lanier releases, because there was yeah. very, very little inflow throughout the rest of the state, and that, that's what, that's what Georgia's concern was, and so they were trying to help the Corps fight that off. But, it's a fascinating subject, and we could spend the next two days talking about it. I'm sure there's <laughs> still have to learn, but l let's say that it's been almost 30 years since the lawsuit. Yeah, was it 1991 or so? Something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah it has been 30 years. Yeah, and this is a, this is a typical time span for, you know, I just yeah. talked about uh, the Lake Ontario thing. A new plan in 1956, and the next one, 2016. Well, I was actually involved with the what came the Water Wars while I was with the Savannah District, and that was in the late 1970s. Uh, that you know, the Corps, if you remember, they proposed a re-regulation dam downstream of Lake Lanier so they could modify their hydropower releases and make more continuous supply available. And, and that that's really kind of started the, uh, the the challenges, I guess, against the Corps. So. Yeah, interesting. Okay. Um, 
in your view, how, how important has been the interaction between software developers and model and modelers uh, in the in the in those projects that you've been involved with? Uh, it, that important, but uh, there's some. I mean, if you're old enough, uh, you probably uh, wonder why we are stuck with Word and not Word Perfect. <clears throat> you know, I always like. I, I wonder about that all the time. <laughs> exactly, but uh, but it's not like it affected who won the Booker Prize last year. So right. models are tools. Uh, you know, there are conflicts between people who prefer one model over another. Um, software can uh, limit you. Uh, in my own career, people have thought of me as a Stella modeler. I tell them, no, I'm a, I'm a planner. Um, if Stella works, that's what I'll use. I never use Stella anymore. I use Excel and other models. Uh, whatever works. And now I'm, you know, in the next phase of my career, I'll be less of a modeler and more of a planner. Um, and that's because of changes in software. And I'll just uh, go with the flow. Um, so for the, uh, with the, the tools you have used in the past, uh, what are the technical or process related enhancements that you think would most improve planning? Uh, well, I, I probably have answered this question uh, before talking about the future of it. Uh, to, for me, it is um, the level of granularity that allows a true integration of <clears throat> multi uh, method management. Let me coin that phrase uh, to say uh, that we could would be able to look at a basin uh, and consider all of our policy options, including uh, structural and non-structural solutions, regulations, as well as investments, um, and determine how that dynamic mix of policies would affect individual homeowners. Uh, if you pull back and look at it more broadly, uh, it is the question of solving problems with big data. Um, just a quick analogy, you know, they say that uh, Elon Musk uh, is or wants to offer uh, car insurance to his Tesla customers. And one of the advantages that he has is that uh, he knows exactly how well they drive. He knows how many stoplights you've run, uh, how fast over the speed limit you drive, and how many times you've had to apply the brakes hard. Um, if you could give advice to someone just starting out in the field of river basin planning, what would it be? Uh, certainly keep going. It's a fascinating field. There's a future in it, I think. Um, <clears throat> practical advice, uh, read about the history of your trade. Um, I was a planner in Buffalo, but I never really understood um, what went into our planning rules. Uh, to learn planning, my boss sent me to the library and gave me three days to read principles and standards. And I was astounded by how thoughtful and well uh, unified they were. At the, the time, I had no idea how they came into creation. Uh, when I went to IWR, um, it was like um, a guy from a little town being able to go to, to the center of the universe. And I met people like uh, Gilbert White and Myron Fearing uh, and Arthur Moss, uh, people who had changed the course of Corps of Engineers planning. And I learned about the history of all these things and the arguments that went into them. Uh, and it gave me a much better contextual sense of where I stood in that flow of events um, and where it could go. So that's what I would tell a young person. Uh, read about the history. There's a lot of people who think planning isn't actually a skill. It's just good common sense. And um, th you need to realize that it is a, a real skill. Uh, to someone uh, that's involved in modeling uh, water resource systems, but maybe is not a planner, what kind of advice would you give? 
you know, I, I would, uh, I guess, um, to be a good modeler, you have to have the ability to really concentrate and focus. Uh, it tends to draw more introspective people um, and good modelers have to make sure that they are answering the questions people want answered. And that is by nature a social task. Uh, so somehow if you're not blessed with that dual personality, um, you have to find a way to check to make sure that the modeling that you're doing is the modeling that's needed. Well, I, th I think that's the uh, that's the last question I have on the, the list here. I, is there anything that you wanted to kind of say to summarize your kind of your philosophy? Um, well, uh, let me let me add this because it, we haven't talked a lot about public participation, um, which was in a way the raison d'etre for shared vision planning, um, and uh, you know. Uh, even as a young planner in Buffalo, I did public participation. <clears throat> uh, the Corps had been doing it for 10 years. It was required by NEPA, required by principles and standards. Um, but what I didn't realize until I, you know, went to the center of planning at IWR was that it was really uh, what Hannah Kortner called uh, era three participation. Uh, I would go to a, a public meeting. The core, the district had arranged uh, the colonel would speak at the end of the meeting at our time in our location. He would ask for questions. Uh, typically, people would raise questions and we would say, well, we're here to announce the results of our draft study. There's only so much we can do to accommodate your point, but we'll take that back with us. The phase four that Hannah Cortner talked about was a real partnership, a dialogue that started at the beginning of the problem. And that's what we tried to do with shared vision planning. We came up with our circles of influence idea. A sociologist who worked at IWR uh, created it. And that, that idea was at the very beginning of a, a problem solving effort, you go out and you meet with your worst uh, critics, your most knowledgeable critics in the public, and you bring them in, you share everything with them. And uh, you understand it's going to be a difficult effort because these people don't trust you um, and they're knowledgeable. They can call you out if you're making mistakes. Um, but if you do the hard work with them, you find that most other people trust them and they will give you trust because they trust them. So that's it's an investment that's required. It's an investment that has to be maintained after the decision is made. But now I would say we're in a fifth era, which I would call uh, the era of disinformation uh, and uh, Facebook and Twitter uh, sharing in which um, the space that we used to create for public involvement, uh, which came with its own restrictions. So it cost money, you had to rent a room, uh, people had to travel to get there, um, people in the public were selected by their peers or appointed by an agency. Uh, and when they met, there were rules of engagement. Uh, most often they were spelled out and, uh, and designed by the people involved. Things like don't interrupt, don't yell, uh, uh, be open-minded, uh, be respectful. Um, none of these things exist in the Facebook world. And, um, because of that, um, and because agencies have used social media um, to engage with the public, we now find a certain portion of um, government effort goes into defending itself against people who are ignorant and ill-tempered, ill-advised, um, and who uh, fire off uh, calumny um, without, a, without much thought. The agency is put in the position of either responding to it or allowing that to be the last comment on the subject. And uh, as these uh, fifth era dialogues continue, uh, there's a wear and tear on the 
uh, government experts. Uh, I've seen competent, honest, uh, uh, tremendously uh, public-oriented uh, engineers uh, criticized in public. Uh, the town that they grew up in uh, reads terrible things about them. There are threats to disclose their home addresses. And they question, why should I take this abuse? Right. This is the fifth era, and uh, I'm struggling, uh, but I am actively trying to find ways to uh, manage uh, dialogue. Um, and it means that there are going to be limits on public participation. Public participation is not in itself uh, an inherently good thing. Uh, it's only good if it serves the public interest. So that's the last thing I would say in the interview is that along with the excitement and challenge of new technology comes the dread and challenge of um, mob sourced criticism. Yeah, I think it, uh, there's been a lot of uh, study in recent years about, and I think this highlights the uh, importance of basically getting the right stakeholders involved. It's not just everybody having an equal voice, it's having People involved that are, uh, you know, uh, affect, you know, are knowledgeable and uh, are open-minded, and at the same time have the command or the authority to, you know, effectively articulate and negotiate positions that are related to the to the issues that you're, that are in conflict, rather than trying to bring in a host of ancillary concerns that really aren't productive or. I mean, these relevant. are good ideas. Good ideas, and and certainly at the heart of circles of influence, which I've, uh, you know, pushed for 20 years, 25 years. But let me tell you a kind of a cautionary tale. Uh, on one of the studies that I'm engaged in now, <clears throat> we had a, a critic in the public who was a hydraulic engineer. He worked on things like pumps in the private industry, but he was smart, knowledgeable. He lived along the lake shore. He had suffered damage during a flood. And uh, we brought him into our inner circle. He was respectful, open-minded, intelligent, mm -hmm. called us out on some things where we had made mistakes. But for the most part was, uh, of course, can you imagine somebody who didn't know anything walking into one of the studies you've been involved in <laughs> and seeing all the data that you've collected and, and all the modeling and all the studies of climate change. It's just, uh, you know, I tell uh, under underclasses, when you're watching a movie and the star is talking in a restaurant, you know that there's one guy whose whole life is devoted to making the background sounds that crowds in restaurants make. They don't just roll the camera and pick up the sound in the background. So, so this guy was duly impressed with the competency and honesty of the government workers who are working on this case. He brought this message back to the people who trusted him in his town, and they said, you've gone over to the other side. They stuck to their conspiracy theories, which are so ignorant um, that I'm embarrassed to repeat them. <laughs> so, so these are new challenges that we haven't faced before. Yeah. It's the willingness to believe things that any reasonable person would dismiss out of hand. Uh, and that there's a, enough people doing this that politicians will respond to that noise and make your life as an honest, technical servant of the people much more difficult. Well, on that happy note, um, <laughs> um, I guess we can uh, conclude the interview. Bill, I really, uh, really enjoyed uh, just listening to your to your uh, kind of career experience and, and history is really rich and diverse. And I well, thank I you. Learned. Thank you, George. Uh, it's nice to reflect back on our long uh, working relationship and hopefully we'll work together again in the future. Yes, Good uh, luck on this on this uh, project too. Yeah, well, thank you.